Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Amir Yazdan from the Modena Hair Institute in Newport Beach, California. I am uh, excited to uh, do a presentation today on botched FUE and uh, robotic device repair. Um, I'm a founding faculty for the Global Hair Loss Summit and a uh, member of the IHRS. Um, and I'm happy to do this talk and share some of my experience with um, patients that have come into my practice um, seeking repair of previous uh, hair transplants that have gone wrong. So with that being said, let's get started. So there's been an increase in FUE hair transplant surgery over the last few years. Uh, hair restoration market is now a $4.6 billion industry and there was more than 2 million people uh, treated for hair loss in 2019. And a lot of this is due to um, access or increased access to um, robotic devices and turnkey devices, which are being marketed to physicians uh, as minimal experience necessary uh, to perform a hair transplant procedure and add ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars a day to your practice. Um, billions of dollars are spent each year on marketing these devices, and the marketing is being done to show that this is a minimally invasive procedure, um, there's no downtime, there's no scarring, and um, you know, come on in and, and have the procedure done and you know, it's minimal risk. Um, you know, like this is now being done in the back of hair salons um, here in the United States. And you know, the, the aftermath is starting to spill over to physicians such as myself in regards to um, you know needing to, to help treat these patients. So the majority of the patients in my practice are about 30 to 40 years old and um, hair is, is of course their main concern, their hair loss and essentially this comes down to just restoring their confidence. Um, we have a lot of patients that we work on that come back and express to us how much better they feel about themselves and how they wish they would have done the procedure a lot sooner. Um, essentially, hair is youth, and the bottom line is that having more hair makes you feel and look younger. Um, it gives patients their confidence back, they feel better about themselves, and um, this is why uh, people seek out the surgery. Um, there's other instances as well where um, patients have you know, lost hair because of trauma, like fires, burns, car accidents, or illnesses. Um, or you know some kind of accident um, that's left them with scarring on on their scalp, but primarily um, the the biggest reason is male pattern baldness or female pattern baldness, and this is why most patients are seeking a hair restoration surgery. So, um, why can anyone perform FUE? Um, here you can see the classic picture of a technician-based uh, practice in Turkey. Um, what you'll see is a room full of uh, patients laying down and their scalp is being incised thousands of times by technicians. Many of these technicians are, you know, have no uh, background medical experience. Some of them are refugees uh, working for, you know, pennies and um, they're performing hair restoration surgery on these patients. And, you know, um, it, it's a dangerous, uh, dangerous situation. Uh, I've had patients that have gone to other countries uh, to have a hair transplant, and not only were they botched, but they came back with communicable diseases such as hepatitis C. So it's something that you know we don't think about. Well, I'm going to go and, and have a surgery done somewhere else, um, but you know, in a facility like this. There's a lot of instruments being shared. There's you know, poor sanitation, um, poor sterilization technique, and so the risk of communicable disease is also higher. Um, you'll also see that the advertisement of an increase in the, the tools and the devices for, for physicians uh, makes it easier for them to do this. When I first started doing FUE surgery, in 2010, there was really not any devices available um, that could, uh, you know, you could buy to do FUE surgery. There was very few. There was just a couple on the market, and everybody was kind of making their own device 
uh, to essentially learn and figure out how to do a better FUE surgery. Today, there's uh, plenty of devices on the market um, and most of them are just being advertised as, you know, no experience necessary. It's a turnkey device, um, buy this for your practice, come on in and, you know, we'll supply technicians assistance. Uh, we'll even give you an app where you can, you know, download the app and book your technicians and assistants to perform the, the entire surgery. Um, of course, you know, this is unethical. Uh, it's illegal in most, uh, most places in the world, but this is what the majority of hair restoration has come down to. And so you get physicians with no background or experience in hair restoration surgery um, utilizing these technicians and assistants to perform the entire surgery. Um, and this is really with minimal involvement of the physician and this is essentially how these technician-based practices are created. So why are bot surgeries now uh, more common and on the rise? Well, that has to do, again, with false advertising. Um, the patients are, you know, being told that this is a minimally invasive procedure. You can see, you know, in the picture here that somebody is advertising a, a Groupon, you know, an extra, you know, $25 or $50 off. I don't even know how that makes sense on a $16,000 surgery for $8,000 and 50% off. And if you're seeing uh, ads like this, that's probably the first sign um, that this is not a practice that you want to be at. Um, and you know, any physician getting into hair restoration surgery um, should be really careful about how they advertise these procedures. Um, you know, you you get paid for doing a proper surgery, doing good quality work. And if you're doing surgeries for you know eight thousand um, dollars you're not doing good quality work. Uh, and that's just kind of kind of what it comes down to. Um, then you get a lot of in, unexperienced physicians that you know pr uh, promise patients unrealistic results. They tell patients that they're going to get full density, that they're going to do one hair transplant and you know that's all the patient needs. They're going to do 4,000 to 5,000 grafts in a procedure. There's no scarring. There's no downtime. Um, a lot of places are now selling the idea that robotic devices and technicians can perform the entire surgery. Uh, and they don't educate the patients that this is actual surgery. Uh, and you need somebody who is trained uh, to do this uh, to perform the surgery. Uh, a lot of the practices also don't perform FUE and FUT or strip method. And so they're not able to give patients an unbiased recommendation. I see a lot of patients come into my practice that have had failed FUE procedures um, and they weren't really a candidate for FUE. They were a much better candidate for a strip procedure, but that certain practice didn't offer a strip procedure. So, you know, they'll show the worst strip scar possible to the patient and say, you know, this is, this is what happens with a strip and, you know, let's, this is why we like to do FUE. And a lot of times that's not true. Um, and, you know, to become good and proficient at FUE surgery, it requires years of experience and thousands of hours uh, of tissue time to be able to create successful results uh, for your patients. Unfortunately, there's no shortcuts and none of these turnkey devices are really able to provide any kind of meaningful shortcut. So what's the definition of botched? Um, you know, this is kind of, again, the classic picture that you'll see on the left is your expectation and on the right side is, is the reality of, of what the patient ends up getting. Um, yeah, I have a couple of definitions of botched um, and I'll kind of go through those for you. Uh, the first one is patients having a surgery and ending up with a severely depleted donor zone with noticeable thinning and, and scarring. Um, a lot of patients today are having these robotic surgeries uh, and the practice has very minimal experience on how to harvest FUE and so they just blow through the patient's donor zone and when they come in for a repair surgery um, at that point we're using beard chest and you know other body hair just to try to get the patient back to um, you know where they were before even undergoing that first bot surgery um, another ex uh, Definition of botched for me is a patient undergoes a surgery and they notice little to no results. 
Uh, and in some cases, patients lose more hair after a hair transplant surgery uh, than you know if they had just not done a surgery at all. And again, this has to do with many different factors, such as how the recipient sites are created, how large the recipient sites are, um, you know, down to how much epinephrine is in the uh, in the lidocaine used for the anesthetic and the tumescent. All of this makes a difference in the hair restoration surgery, and if performed improperly, can cause the patients to actually lose hair after the surgery. Um, the other big one is unnatural and uneven hairlines that are noticeable to everyone. Um, th today, I have a lot of patients coming to me for repair of their hairlines um, that, again, was done by an inexperienced practice, which was either physician or technician based. And generally what I see is the hairlines are either brought too low um, or they're very straight. They don't have uh, any kind of variation in it. There's, you know, it, it just looks poorly done. Um, and the wrong graft placement and angulation. They're putting two, three, four hair grafts in the uh, hairline um, at the incorrect angles. And once the hairline is done incorrectly, it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's something that everybody sees. The eye is directed to immediately. And, you know, um, patients are looking at that every single day and they just absolutely hate it. Um, and finally, the last one is, you know, complications, which, um, you know, to me are patients developing multiple cysts, um, tenting, uh, cobblestoning. And a lot of this is due to um, the practice. And that has to do with either poor graft placement, uh, incorrect recipient site creation, either the depth being too short or being too deep. Um, or double placing of the graphs and, and so forth. So, you know, this is kind of a, a small list of, you know, my definition of botched and uh, procedures that I'm uh, repairing on a uh, very frequent basis uh, these days. So what are the psychological impacts of having a botched hair transplant surgery? Well, the very first one is patients experience a financial strain. Um, you know, patients go in a lot of times the first surgery looking to just do one surgery to get their hair back, get their confidence back, get their youth back, and um, they think that that's it. They never think that if something goes wrong and this surgery goes wrong, I'm going to have to find someone else to fix it. And, um, and you know, um, that cost for that repair is generally considerably higher than the first bargain uh, surgery that, that they had done. And so uh, this puts patients in a very uh, difficult financial strain, having to pay for one or two corrective surgeries. And they oftentimes feel very frustrated. They feel, feel very cheated, um, very upset. And um, so, you know, that leads to the second part which is the emotional impacts. You know, they, they're very embarrassed. Um, I have patients that come to me that have this procedure done. They'll tell their significant other, their girlfriend, their fiance, that they're going, you know, out on vacation or they're going away for work because they don't want to tell them about the hair transplant surgery. They end up having the surgery done and something goes wrong. And now they don't want to see the girlfriend or the fiance. So, you know, they end up splitting up with them. Um, I've had younger patients who don't tell their parents. They, you know, tell you know, are away. They go have the procedure done, and you know, now something's gone wrong, and they can't go see their parents. So I have patients telling me, "Look, I haven't seen my mom and my dad for six months now," um, and you know, they they avoid them, and they're you know, extremely, extremely um, embarrassed and upset. Um, in other cases, patients quit their jobs. I have patients who are physicians that have had botched hair transplant surgeries and they can't go back to work. Their staff can't see them. Um, their office can't see them. Patients can't see them. I have patients that are attorneys, judges that have had botched hair transplants. They can't go to court. They can't go to trial because they can't wear hats in the courtroom. I mean, I've seen so much of this um, that, you know, this is why I'm doing this talk to put this put this word out for patients or physicians that are looking to get into hair transplant surgery. Um, I've also had patients in, in some cases um, want to commit suicide. They'll, they'll come in and they'll say, look, I can't live like this anymore. I can't look at myself like this. I can't live like this. I want to just run across a freeway or, or jump off a bridge. 
Um, and that's really, really sad when, when you see somebody, you know, at that point of their life, um, due to a botched hair restoration surgery. Um, even at times when you fix these surgeries, um, these patients continue to experience increased levels of insecurity um, because of what was done to them and, and what, they, what they went through. So now let's get to um, the disadvantages of the robotic surgery. And again, a lot of these are just my opinion, having about 12 years of experience, primarily performing uh, FUE and strip surgeries every single day of my life almost. Um, this is what I've come to find as the shortfalls of the robotic uh, surgeries. Um, you know, if you look online and look at the marketing, you're gonna see that people are gonna call this the gold standard and they're gonna tell you that the robotic surgery, you know, requires minimal experience to perform a hair transplant and, you know, all these, all these great things about it. But in true practice, um, you know, there's a lot of downfalls to it. And the first one is um, it uses a larger punch size than a skilled FUE surgeon. If you look at the, the left, you can see here with where my cursor is, you can see that this is the punch size of, of a robotic device. And over here is the punch size of a skilled surgeon doing it by hand with smaller punches. These smaller incisions uh, lead to the patient having uh, a lot less tissue trauma, um, a lot less scarring, and you end up with smaller grafts. And because you end up with smaller grafts, you can uh, essentially make smaller recipient site incisions to place the grafts and therefore there's less uh, trauma uh, to the uh, recipient zone where they're being transplanted. Uh, the other thing you can see is uh, what I call overstacking of the punches. So if you look right here, you'll see that there's very close grouped punches together. You'll see that here, you'll see it in, in all these areas. And these are where the robot has just punched very closely and this ends up creating a much larger scar. So patients who have this kind of procedure done in the future have a really difficult time wearing their hair short if need be um, versus uh, you know, a patient who has this done properly by a smaller punch. You can just immediately see uh, that this side is going to scar much less than this side would. Um, again, due to the larger punch size, a lot of the, the graphs done by the robotic device end up being trimmed down. Um, and that trimming down uh, decreases their survival rate because it's more handling of the graft, it's more uh, trimming of the graft, and so a lot of times, you know, that uh, that process ends up just manipulating the grafts too much, and you get lower survival rate of the grafts. And again, as I mentioned before, when you have larger grafts, they require larger recipient site incisions for the place uh, graft placement. Um, the other thing is that the robotic device doesn't work very well um, all over the scalp, um, including uh, superficial angles and the sides of the scalp. It, it generally works you know, decently in this area, but in areas where there's uh, superficial uh, uh, angulation of the hair, the robot has a hard time um, extracting those and so you end up seeing a higher transection rate and more damage and trauma to the follicles in those areas. Um, the robot also does not w work well with curly or textured skin. So one of the things I specialize in is hair restoration surgery for African American patients. And in those patients, FUE can, can at times be more difficult because they do have a natural curvature to their hair follicle and it kind of corkscrews or coils or hooks under the skin. And so the robot um, is not able to work very well for these and so for those kinds of patients, um, it, it, you know, it, it, it's not as effective. It doesn't really work so well. And so again, you end up, you know, blowing through the patient's donor zone and you end up harvesting um, a minimal number of grafts. Um, also, the, the robotic devices only work on the scalp. So there's no way of harvesting body hair, like for example, beard or chest hair with any of the robotic devices if, if need be. Um, one of the other things I don't like about the robotic devices is generally they tend to have a higher transection rate and damage to the follicular units during the harvesting. And the reason why is what happens is in the robot, 
you have a tensioner device. It's a square. So it'll, it'll be a square like, like this that you'll um, put into the skin and stretch out the skin. And then what happens is the robot reads the edges of that tensioner device and then it starts to go into the area and starts to punch out the graphs. So let's say you let the robot punch out about 100 graphs. Well, what happens is the, the arm punches the 100 graphs and then the arm moves away and then you start to, to remove those graphs with forceps. The problem is, is while it's punching those graphs, you generally don't have an idea whether it's transecting or damaging those follicles until you start to actually remove the grafts by the forceps. And sometimes you'll see that 50, 60% of the grafts have been damaged and there's nothing you can do about that. Those are just either wasted or damaged grafts. When the procedure is done by hand by a skilled surgeon, if you, you can feel that the graft is different or that the angle has changed or that just something is not right and it's not may not come out, you can stop, try to extract the graft out and at that point, you know, you might damage one graft or two grafts versus 50 grafts. Um, so I think that that's a, a big downside to, to the robotic surgeries. Um, finally, um, a lot of places um, is the robotic devices are attractive to inexperienced physicians because they're being marketed and sold um, as turnkey units that require no experience and, you know, no... Um, knowledge in hair restoration surgery and you know the robot will do the surgery for you and that's the farthest thing from from the truth and finally the last thing I've noticed is that um, physicians are, are, are generally charged per graft um, by the the device manufacturers so that means that you know if you punch out a thousand grafts you're gonna pay um, a certain fee for every one of those punches and so generally what I've seen practices do is set the robot to punch out four hair follicular unit grafts and then the physician's team dissects or cuts down those grafts to try to essentially save costs or cut corners or cut costs um, with the robot. And so you end up getting a lot of four hair unit grafts that are extracted and then trimmed down and again that decreases the survival rate of, of these, these grafts. Um, and finally, what happens when you sit into the chair of the robot with an inexperienced team that's going to work on your scalp and the robot is not working? They have no other way and no other experience to um, harvest uh, the FUE grafts and to continue the procedure. So generally what happens is they just keep going and going and going and they blow through the donor density and the patient ends up having one robotic surgery that fails, is poorly done, and they have no donor density left to actually repair that botched surgery. So now we're gonna get into some examples of botched surgeries that have come into my practice um, and you know I've had to repair. So this first one is actually um, from a physician who had a uh, robotic surgery um, in Los Angeles um, in a, uh, I think it's, it's in the back of a hair salon. And so this is, was, was primarily done by technicians and assistants. And you can see that the patient, um, has a lot of depletion and thinning in their donor zone. And they've lost all of the hair back here in the back, uh, and the sides as well. And this has to do again with the over harvesting um, too many grafts being extracted at one time, large punch being used to harvest the grafts, and this essentially causes so much vascular uh, trauma to the back of the scalp, it decreases the blood supply so much that there is a result of, of thinning and hair loss in that donor zone, which is permanent, unfortunately. So in cases like this, the way that, that we um, tend to have to um, repair them is um, we use body hair to transplant into the donor zone. So um, this patient um, had uh, grafts taken from his beard and we transplanted as many grafts, I think it was about a thousand grafts or so into the beard. And then um, we used scalp micropigmentation to pigment the area as well to try to give the illusion of more fullness and more density. So if you look real closely, you can see here um, is, is a little bit the, of the micropigmentation. 
all the way throughout. And then you can see all of these graphs that we transplanted throughout the entire donor zone um, to try to add back more dent, as much density as, as we can. Um, one of the things that I refer to when I'm teaching these courses or talking to patients is, is the apple tree analogy. When you have a hair restoration surgery, which is done by FUE, um, naturally the physician, it, it's the, the human tendency to pick the best grafts. And it's, it's kind of like an apple tree. When you go out to the apple tree on the first day, you're going to inherently just pick the best apples because those are the ones that you want. When you go back to the apple tree the next day, the best apples aren't there anymore. You're, you're left with the second best apples. And when you go the third day, you're left with the third best apples. So a lot of times the patients that come in for a repair of their botched hair transplant, um, you know, you're not working with the best hair anymore. You're working with anything you can to just try to create an improvement. And this is the, the, the thing that I try to explain to patients from the beginning is, we're generally not gonna be able to get you back to 100%. We're not gonna be able to reverse completely the failed or botched transplant, but we can try to improve it significantly to try to just make things better as much as possible. Um, and that's an important um, expectation to set for the patients because these patients are already very vulnerable. They've gone through a bad experience. They've felt they've been cheated and they feel cheated. And it's very important to set a very realistic expectation as to what you can do for them um, so that they know what they're getting into before they undergo a corrective surgery. Um, these are more examples of um, scarring with uh, robotic devices. Um, you can see in this side, again, um, the, uh, sorry about that. You can see in the side again, um, the hypopigmented uh, lesions uh, that you'll see through the donor zone. Um, this again has to do with the larger punch size, uh, the double stacking of, of the robot. That's what's created a lot of this, this scarring. Um, of course, a patient like this is not gonna be able to wear their hair short um, down in the future. This patient came in for repair um, of, of his, his uh, donor zone as well as trying to fix and add more density into his hairline. Um, also down here, you'll see the same thing. You'll see a lot of scarring from uh, a robotic device surgery. Uh, what I think was done here is the tensioner was put in a straight line. So one tensioner was put here, another one was put here, and nothing was put down here to kind of spread out or even out the extraction of the grafts. And so, you know, you're left with, with this significant scarring um, left by a uh, robotic FUE procedure. And the way that I repair these, again, is um, a lot of times with uh, scalp micropigmentation where I'm just kind of tattooing um, those hypopigmented lesions um, to try to minimize and mask the, uh, the FUE scarring. So you can see in this first picture, I've started that scalp micropigmentation. There's a lot of thinning. Um, there's a lot of patchiness through here. This is better density. This is less density with hypopigmented scarring. Um, and it's from the side all the way um, to, the, to the other side. And you can see here as the scalp micropigmentation is being performed and going along, and then this is kind of the final result um, after the scalp micropigmentation. Again, it's not perfect, but you know, to the eye, this area looks a lot more dense versus this. There's a lot less hypopigmentation and white spots. And generally speaking, this looks to the eye more acceptable than this, than, you know, this does. Um, these are some more botch cases that have come uh, into my practice. Um, this is kind of what I call the FUE window. Um, this patient, I'm really unsure how something like this happened, um, but again, uh, he had significant scarring from, from a uh, FUE surgery back here. He's left with a window back here. Um, this, uh, I had to uh, actually, I, I excised it, and then um, I ended up putting uh, uh, FUE grafts into uh, this, this whole area and micropigmenting it. Um, this patient, again, you can see a window back here from where the FUE was done. And again, this is uh, primarily from just an incorrect harvesting method, um, extraction not being blended well, and patients are left with this square box or window of depleted hair in their donor zone. 
Um, and again, uh, this is just shows uh, donor zone where I did scalp micropigmentation to kind of fill in some of this, uh, some of the window. Again, you can kind of see this patchiness here, but um, you know it's 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 been uh, improved in terms of uh, the the final results. And then this is going to be an example of a patient with poor results or no results. So this patient had undergone an FUE uh, robotic uh, transplant down in uh, um, San Diego area. Um, and you can see this is his pre-op photo with really minimal results. If you see his hairline, he had these wispy hairs through the hairline. Um, going back, there's very poor density. Nothing really grew here uh, and a lot of, lot of hair loss. Um, this patient, I think, had uh, decreased graft survival rate due to poor extraction of grafts. The grafts were probably split or cut, mishandled, stored in an incorrect uh, storage solution, um, and probably the surgery was done by inexperienced technicians who were handling, placing the grafts, and, and performing the, the surgery. Um, the patient came to me for his corrective surgery. I performed one FUE surgery uh, for him, and you can see one year later the results. He has a very natural looking hairline. Um, it's going back. You can see this area is filled in very nicely. Um, and the farther you go back, the you know it, it, it's very uniform, very even, and this looks very natural. It, it minimally looks like this patient had a hair transplant done in the past. Um, if you look closely, you'll see these wispy hairs are still here, um, but I've masked them with, uh, with the transplant that I did, and we've just kind of camouflaged them and, and hid them. Um, and so, you know, again, you can never make it perfect. Had the patient come to me in the beginning, his hairline would have been very good. Um, but, you know, I've improved it quite a bit and added a lot of density for him and tried to change his outcome from a poor hair transplant to uh, a story where, you know, he was able to get a lot of density in, in his hair back. Um, again, this is another example of a patient that came to me um, with, with poor results. Um, this was after his FUE surgery. He had very minimal graft growth um, and a lot of patchiness into the hairline and going back. Um, these are again the, 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 the pictures from the side angle. He had no hair here on the side. Um, and so I performed one FUE surgery again for him. Uh, added a lot more density, uh, corrected the hairline, and um, gave him a lot more fullness, especially on the sides over here where he had no hair. Now again, if you look at his hairline, it's not perfect, um, but it's much better than, than what it was. And again, this patient came to me um, with a depleted donor zone. Um, I had, you know, basically the third round of apples, and you know, what I had to work with was not the best grafts, but we made the best out of it and utilizing the grafts properly, I was able to camouflage his previous transplant and add more density and, and give him a lot more fullness and just give, give him a better, better look. Um, these are examples of plug looking grafts. Um, this picture was of a surgery that was sent to me. Um, I, I think it came from the Colorado area or something to that extent. Um, this ended up in a legal case um, this, of course, I mean, anyone can look at this and know that a hair transplant in today's age should not look at, like this. Um, the bottom right case uh, was a patient that came to me out of Las Vegas. Uh, this was a CEO that underwent a, uh, a robotic surgery. Um, there was large plug uh, grafts placed from the hairline all the way back into um, the mid scalp and the crown. Uh, too large of a punch was used. Um, four hair grafts were, were selected and none of them were, you know, even trimmed down. Um, they were just retransplanted and the patient was left with a lot of these pluggy looking grafts. Um, so in these cases, a lot of times what we do is we'll use laser hair removal in the hairline um, to get rid of the pluggy looking grafts. And then in the crown and mid scalp area, I'll, I'll actually punch these grafts back out. Um, we'll trim them down. Um, split them and then use them to retransplant them correctly. At the same time, we'll perform a procedure uh, of FUE from his donor zone and use those grafts to camouflage um, as much as uh, of these plug-looking grafts as, as possible. 
Um, so in this case, you'll see that in the hairline, his hairline is not pluggy looking anymore. Um, we corrected the hairline uh, very nicely, made it a lot softer. Um, but again, I had to use laser hair removal to, um, to remove uh, the plug looking grafts and essentially um, you know, harvest or punch out the grafts from the mid scalp and the crown and redisperse them properly to try to get this guy the most improved look that, that we could. Um, this is a patient that came to me um, because he underwent a robotic transplant uh, for his hairline. And again, you can see very poor results. This patient is a news reporter. Um, he skipped out on work to have a hair transplant done. Hair transplant did not go so well. And um, he ended up uh, you know, having to go on camera, starting to wear hats and cover up this botched hair transplant. Um, this was done by an inexperienced physician uh, in the Los Angeles area. Um, the hairline uh, design was delegated to assistance. Um, the, essentially the entire surgery was delegated to assistance. Um, they use very large punches in the donor area. You can see that the grafts are very large. They're very big. Um, all of them are angulated incorrectly. The sites were all created uh, by uh, uh, technicians, not by an experienced uh, physician. And so you have these very poor growth. There was nothing that grew here or back here. And you just had these uh, very poor looking grafts uh, here in the hairline that the patient was hiding now, you know, on TV as a commentator uh, or newscaster uh, wearing a hat. Um, so in his corrective surgery, um, I again uh, uh, had, had a depleted donor zone that I was working with. Um, I harvested out as many FUE grafts as I could possibly. Um, this is the pre-surgery uh, line drawings with a new hairline design, um, as well as uh, through here. You can see that I've uh, focused on the hairline. I've evened it up. I've added a lot of density and um, essentially hid or masked those uh, poor looking, poor angulated grafts. And then I've added uh, density uh, going back there to try to, again, improve uh, this guy's outcome as, as much as possible. Um, and again, I, I, I keep stressing that once a patient has a bot surgery, trying to uh, achieve a great transplant is very, very difficult. Um, and so again, like if this patient had come to me or an experienced uh, hair restoration surgeon from the beginning, he would have had a much better experience and a much better outcome. Unfortunately, he spent the money, had a bot surgery, um, and then had to spend money again to have that corrected, and it's never going to be as good as it was um, had he have you know uh, had a, a good uh, surgery from from the, the beginning. And finally, um, I'm going to uh, discuss a case of uh, of uh, trauma repair. This is not a, a botched repair, but this is a patient that I've been working with for quite some time now. She was involved in a major car accident and had burns to about 80% of her scalp. Um, she had uh, skin grafting done uh, in the, uh, uh, that was, the grafts were taken from her thighs and that grafting was placed into the scalp. And uh, we also uh, had to place tissue expanders uh, for about a period of six months for her um, to try to um, get uh, as much hair uh, with flaps back over into the scalp as possible. Um, so this is the tissue expander placed in here, uh, and this is a picture of uh, the resection of the tissue expanders, uh, as well as the skin graft. You can also see that her eyebrow is uh, deformed as well. Um, it's angulated up and pulled up. Um, so she came to me um, for, to do her uh, corrective surgeries, and so we've been going through this for, for some time now. Um, recently, after all the, the expander surgery, what we did was um, I did a strip surgery um, to fill in the scarring, uh, even out her hairline, and also to correct her, her eyebrow. Prior to that surgery, um, what I did was PRP with fat grafting. Uh, this scar tissue had very poor vascularization. The blood supply was not very great. Um, I did three sessions of PRP with fat grafting, uh, spaced out about every six weeks into the, the area. Um, that helps with the revascularization and it helps uh, with the new grafts and uh, so that the survival rate of the grafts are higher. So we did 
and initially an FUT strip surgery for her. Um, you can see that the grafts were placed into all that scar tissue. I pulled her hairline forward to a very appropriate amount. Um, and also I, uh, I, I repaired her uh, left eyebrow um, all the way from the head, all the way to the tail. Um, I chose to do a strip surgery for this patient because um, I, I needed to get a lot of grafts. There was a consideration. This is uh, somebody very experienced to do this. She had a lot of tension in the scalp because of the previous tissue expanders and, and surgeries she had uh, previously. So um, when the scalp was cut open for the FUT, um, you have to understand closure techniques to be able to close it properly because it, it does open up very, very largely when there's that kind of tension uh, on the tissue. Um, but ultimately I decided that it was better to do the first surgery with an FUT strip surgery because um, I was able to achieve a larger number of grafts without shaving a lot of her hair. And um, so you can see uh, this, these are post-surgery photos. And then this is gonna be about three months after her surgery. You can see uh, how well the grafts are starting to come in, how well the grafts are starting to grow. You can also see her left eyebrow, the head to the tail is shaped very nicely um, compared to the other one. And um, she's going to continue to get uh, improved results over uh, over the next uh, few months. Um, uh, we have one more surgery scheduled for her where it's going to be an FUE. Uh, I'm going to use the FUE grafts to pull her hairline a little bit more forward and add some more density into into this area. So this is just um, you know an example of how bad somebody can um, you know be disfigured and how much a hair restoration surgery can help a patient such as this. Um, she went from you know really uh, having a lot of scar tissue, a lot of scarring, not a lot of hair, um, to you know be looking very good. She feels much better about herself. She's very happy, and um, this was a you know very nice outcome for her. Um, so again, this is going to just show um, the before. Um, you can see uh, the, the dense scar tissue that she has here. Uh, this is three months post-op where the grafts are starting to grow in. Um, this gives you a very good uh, idea of her eyebrow um, before the surgery. And then again, this is her eyebrow th just three months after a hair transplant surgery by, by myself. So I'm gonna leave uh, this talk with what you can do as a hair restoration surgeon or somebody coming in new to this field. Um, the most important thing is uh, learn how to correctly perform FUE surgery with many different instruments. Um, one instrument isn't going to work on all patients. The robot isn't going to work on every patient. Vacuum assistant devices aren't going to work on every patient. Hand assisted devices, sharp punches, dull punches, serrated punches, all these, these things you need to have experience with everything so that you can figure out what the best tool is to use for that patient. Um, and there's no shortcuts to this. You can't cut corners. Um, you just have to put the time into doing it, and that's time on tissue. It takes thousands of hours to become proficient at FUE. It takes millions of graft extractions to get good at it, and there's no shortcut to this. You just have to do this every day, day in, day out. You have to love doing it. You have to want to do it, and if you put that time in the tissue, um, you will get good at it. The next thing is you need to have an experienced staff and a good team. Hair transplant surgery is not a one person show. Um, your assistants, your staff needs to be good. They need to know how to handle the grafts. They need to know how to sort the grafts. They need to know um, with placement, um, how to assist you with placing, how to place, how to hold the grafts because you can be the best surgeon at, at extracting the grafts, but if you know your team mishandles the grafts, um, you know, that can ruin and destroy the whole surgery. Um, you need to be ethical. Um, you can't delegate this surgery to assistants te and technicians. Um, the standard of care from my understanding is no assistants or technicians which are unlicensed um, should be making incisions in the scalp. They should not be harvesting grafts. They should not be drawing in hairlines. They should not be administering anesthetics. Um, they shouldn't be making any decisions as to how the surgery is done. Assistants and technicians are there to assist you as the surgeon. You are essentially the captain of the ship. You are the pilot of the plane. You need to um, you know, be able to do the surgery. You need to know 
um, how everything works and you need to be proficient at it. And if you're not proficient at it, you need to get the right training before you jump in and you start doing surgery on, on patients. Um, you wanna start with small cases. Don't overpromise patients and perform procedures that are larger than you're comfortable with. Don't start promising patients 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 graft FUE cases. Start with the smaller cases, get good at doing the smaller cases, and then slowly start to advance and take on the larger cases. And finally, be honest with your patients uh, about the results that you can achieve for them. If you see a patient and you don't think that you can help them, let somebody else that has more experience take over that. Don't try to do every surgery. Pick and choose the right ones until you get enough experience to actually be able to do that surgery for the patient. At the end of the day, we're in this to help patients. We're, we're doing this to give patients their confidence back, give them their youth back, and you have to do this ethically. And if you can't help the patient and your surgery is going to end up botching them and they're gonna end up in my office or somebody else's office for a repair surgery, that's not fair for the patients. And you don't wanna practice that's, that's doing that. Do the, the practice right, start small, gain experience, and then, uh, and then move on to, to better cases. So I hope uh, this talk was um, meaningful and um, you guys learned something from it. I'm always available via email at dryazdan at modenahair.com if you guys have any questions for this. And um, I hope uh, to see you guys in the future.